is from the NIV version. <clears throat> and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they're seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men that they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so it won't be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father, who is unseen, and your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Thanks be to God. Alicia, come and join us. And... Your guests? Yeah. Can I invite them? Yeah. If you're a special guest, come up and I can, I can pray for you all together. We've got a slightly different format this morning for our, our preach, our sermon. We've got some special guests with us on stage who I'll let Felicia introduce in a moment. But I'm just going to pray for these five wonderful women. Thank you, Lord God, that you bring us your word and that your word is alive, that these words that I've just read from the Bible, they're not some dead thing, some ink printed on a page, but they're spirit-breathed and that they require understanding and interpretation, that your spirit is alive in them and through them. And I just thank you now for these women who are going to um, illuminate some different aspects of prayer for us this morning. Amen. Morning, church. It's a privilege to be with you today. And through our season of Bible studies uh, in the church, we've been looking at Jesus, our teacher. And as you see today, the section we're going to talk about is prayer. So when I got this section, I thought, I don't want to stand up here and tell you how to pray, because... You know how to pray. My only message would be, just do it. And a very short message. But I also thought, well, why don't I get people to come up on stage with me and share some different aspects of prayer that we maybe all have to go through in life and share how they've been through it and what God has done for them. So why I say just do it, there was a story about a church in South Korea. I don't know if you've heard of it. It was run by a man called David Jong-e Cho. And it's got about over a million members in that church. And it's very much built on prayer. He's a very much a strong prayer leader. And they pray 24-7 in a certain part of the church. And so his wife was invited to America to a conference. And they asked her to give an explanation on prayer, explaining how they pray and what they do. So they gave her a big introduction We've got David Jungi Cho's wife here. She's come to teach us about prayer. 
and they called her to the pulpit. She just opened her mouth and said, the secret to prayer is to pray. <laughs> and then she sat down again. <laughs> so we all pray. You know, even atheists pray. In times of trouble, atheists would be known to pray. And there's a story of a man who, he's in the woods, he's an atheist, he's in the woods, and he's hunting around, and he bumps into a bear. So the bear starts to chase after him, and he gets very scared because he knows he's going to get eaten. So he looks up to heaven and says, I need help, God. And God says, oh, do you want to become a Christian now? And he says, no, make the bear a Christian. At that point, the, the bear is about to eat him, but the bear stops. He puts his hands together and says, Lord, for the food I'm about to eat, may I be grateful. <laughs> so, so the word pray or prayer or prayed is about 85% of the Old Testament. And it's about 92% of all the books in the New Testament. So it goes right through the Bible. And as Christians, praying is like breathing. It's just talking to God. There's no formality. It doesn't have to be hours and hours. It's just you talking to your heavenly father. You can do it on your way to work. You can do it while you feed your baby. You can do it on the tube. But it becomes a habit for the Christian. And they say the habits that you have determine your destiny. So when we read the Bible, David said he prays seven times a day. Daniel prayed three times a day. And Jesus prayed without ceasing. And Paul says we should be like that. Pray to God continually without ceasing. So today, I've got my beautiful sisters with me. And we're going to talk about four different aspects of prayer. We're going to talk about prayer in desperation, prayer in inspiration, prayer for provision, and prayer for peace. Try and na navigate notes and sliders and everything. So, the first one is prayer through desperation. And I'm going to read about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Then Pat Beauchamp at the end there. Hi, Pat. Say hello to everybody. <laughs> She's going to share with us um, about what it means to pray in a time of desperation. So, Matthew 26, 36 to 44. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not what as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to the disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away from me unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he had come back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. In the book of Hebrews, we are told that as Christians, we have a high priest, who is Jesus Christ, who can feel our infirmities. So when we are going through a time of distress, Jesus understands. When we see him in the skull of Gethsemane, he's going to something that makes him feel that he wished he could die because he knows what's going to happen to him next. As a believer, you have the Holy Spirit in your heart. So when you pray, either aloud or in your heart, the Holy Spirit conveys that prayer to Jesus, 
And Jesus, as your high priest, puts that prayer before God. Now, our struggle is, why doesn't God answer? But I want to assure you that there's no prayer too big or too small for God to answer. In fact, God invites us to pray. When we don't pray, we're not trusting God. In fact, we're trusted in ourselves, and that doesn't please God. So I'm going to turn to Pat now, talking about praying in desperation. So Pat, how long have you been a Christian? Uh, 59 years. Put your, so put your mic up, please. Oh, <laughs> 59 years. Okay, praise the Lord. Is that a good sound on there? James? Can you hear her? Can you hear her? Oh, I mean, hold on. Bit of a technical... Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I've been a Christian 59 years. Wow. And this scripture we just read about Jesus, what does it tell us about him? Um, well, I was, I, he, I'm going to read it. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> um, his sorrow in his heart was so great that it was almost crushing him. He wanted the support of Peter and the other two to keep a watchful eye, so he was safe to talk to his father, as Jesus knew the chief priests and elders were after him. I think he felt hurt and let down, because he had no support from them. Although he knew the terrible suffering he would have to endure, rejection from the people he loved and helped. Jesus' love is so great that no matter what, he was willing to obey his father as a sin offering for us. Thank you. And the reason why I asked Pat to share with us, I know she's a woman of prayer, but she's been through so much, so do bear with us as the emotions come out. And so, Pat, how has this scripture helped you in challenging times? But there's one thing going back a long time ago that some people might remember. But in 1985, I was pregnant with our first child. The pregnancy didn't have, did have its ups and downs because of my age at 38 years. I had an amniocentesis to check to see if the baby was abnormal or not. I expected everything to be okay. I was four and a half months pregnant, then one day I felt very unwell at work. That night I had a call from the hospital to say my baby had something wrong with her. And to come into the hospital the next day for a termination. Did you hear that? I felt my world had collapsed. I was on my own. Tony was on a long trip because he was a lorry driver. I felt more unwell. And when I did get to hospital the next morning, they said I was losing the baby anyway. As I was at home recovering from losing my baby, I remember praying to God and saying to him, Lord, I am 38 now. If I don't have any more children, that's okay. I have your love and you will never leave me or forsake me. As well, Pat. Your will be done. It is, it was five years later, at 45 years old, I was pregnant with Mark. I had an amazing pregnancy and I felt so well. 
God answered my prayers. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Thank you for sharing that. I know it was hard, but I thank you for digging deep. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Bless your name, Jesus. I'm now going to turn to Nikki, and we're going to talk about prayer for inspiration. And this is the scripture to do with, um, so I just got distracted there, to do with Jesus choosing the 12 apostles. So, um, hi, Nikki. Yeah, I'm just going to read the scripture. Let's bring it on here. There's a lot going on over here. So one day, one of those days, Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them whom he designated as apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a tra traitor. Now, in the book of James, we are told as believers to seek wisdom from God, and that we're supposed to be led by the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to talk to Nikki now. Nikki, how long have you been a Christian? Um, I became a Christian when I was 12, so 38 years ago. All yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. And then, why do you feel Jesus went to pray at this time of his ministry? I think it was a massive decision, wasn't it? What a, like a massive work decision. How do you pick your 12, you know, main people? Um, I, and as I was thinking about it as well, I thought probably God could have just written it on a wall, couldn't he? Could, could I wake up tomorrow, give me the 12 <laughs> names, done. But I, I, I kind of imagine that Jesus probably already had some ideas. You know, this is my favorite, or this one would be really good at that. He had some ideas. He knew that God, his father, would have some ideas, and he needed that time and space to really wrestle with that together and come out with a plan. Yeah. Fantastic. And has the scripture helped you in a time you had to make the decision? Yeah, I think the ideas of it helped me a lot, the idea of getting away somewhere quiet for a bit of time, and that's helped me over and over again. Um, you know what it's like when you're in your own house. There are people who want stuff, people who need stuff, jobs you could do. And I find to get out of my house and go somewhere else, maybe the river, maybe a cafe. There's a little place in the Royal Festival Hall I really like to go where no one else goes. I don't know why. <laughs> so I hide away in there and, and get away and have time and space to be able to hear God and talk things through. Fantastic. Do you have a specific example of what happened for you? Yeah, I think in the half term that's just gone, um, I have been struggling lately, um, feeling like I'm not quite coping with um, the effects of the menopause, and that's been quite just agitating. My job's quite intense, and then there's some family um, pressures as well. So those three things together have made me feel I really need some inspiration of how to do life differently. It's not, it's not I'm not quite coping the yeah. way I've been doing my life for a while. Yeah. Um, so I went to the Royal Festival Hall, to this place, got a coffee. No one else is there. And what I like to do is um, write as well. So just sort of ask God to guide me. Write, write down what I think might be the options. Listen, get some inspiration from God. Um, sometimes God speaks to me in pictures or words or a bit of the Bible. And through that process, I came up with a, a new plan, so to reduce my work a bit. Yeah. The idea popped into my head. We could go back to school and ask them what more they could do, so wow. I've done that, and that resulted in a really helpful intervention. And um, just, I guess what I wanted to say as well is, often God doesn't give me the grand plan. You know, this is what you're going to do for the next year, or this is what's going to happen. It's the next step. Mm well, the next thing I can do, yeah. and, and that really was what I, like, I felt I got that afternoon, you know, this is, just try this, try this till Christmas, yeah. you know, and then let's meet again. Yeah, yeah. yeah so. Fantastic. Yeah. And I, I noticed that on the questions I asked you, but as you mentioned this thing, how do you know that's what God is saying to you to write down? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. I think I get a, I think, when I was thinking about it, I was thinking about the idea of God as an architect. You know, when, if you see an architect, you've got some ideas already, haven't you? 
uh, and they've got some ideas, and together you come up with a plan. And I think I already have some ideas. So I write down my ideas. Yeah. Maybe I could just give up work completely. <laughs> and then, as I, then I sit and I, and I go through the ideas and I ask God just to give me peace in my heart and to speak to me. And, and it's a soft whisper, isn't it? It's, it's maybe the idea of, well, you, you wouldn't like that. No, actually, no, I wouldn't like that. <laughs> you know, and then another one has more peace around it. Okay, you could reduce, okay, that feels peaceful. So, so for me, it's that kind of process of where yes. does the peace settle? Do we all agree with that? It's when you have peace and then you know that that's God speaking. That's perfect. It is the peace that God's, we're going to come to that. But thank you so much for that. Wonderful. Thank you. And then we're going to look at now prayer for provision. We have Marie Yusuf. So I'm just going to read the scripture, Philippians 4.19. It says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. So Marie, how long have you been a Christian? Um, <clears throat> well, I grew up in a Christian family. I gave my life to Jesus. You put your mic uh, Sorry, I gave my life to Jesus at a summer camp when I was 11. Uh, so that would be 48 years ago. Oh, wow. But, yeah, I got called by the Holy Spirit when I was 23. So, yeah, you can decide journey. for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> 48 years officially, I guess. Wow. Yeah. And what comfort do you get from this scripture? Um, well, actually, that chapter itself uh, is very meaningful to me, especially, if, uh, and I fully agree with this, how God will meet all your need, needs. And, uh, and I tend to be quite an anxious person when it comes to sort of uh, money matters and uh, sort of things about the future and all these things of what will happen in the future, what will I do. And I found this chapter, this Philippians 4, and I, and I don't know how Felicia knew about this, but she gave me just the right one, and it speaks, don't be anxious yeah, we can come about to that anything, one. but in everything, by prayer and petition, bring your request unto God with thanksgiving, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And that is me, that is me, anxious. And I had to learn to do this, to come on my knees and bring every worry, every anxiety, every fear that I had before the Lord. And it is a bit of a battle because whatever is going on in your head is so confusing and you're not sure how to pray even. But as you start doing it, you start feeling the Holy Spirit is beginning to speak. And he said, okay, don't worry about tomorrow. Oh, that's another Bible verse. Quickly look <laughs> it up. And I realized that is a key not to worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. So it means trusting God. And so as I keep praying, you get the Holy Spirit speaking to me. Uh, so it is very much... Um, a word of, when you're anxious, yeah, bring those requests to God and then listen to God at the same time. So it is the listening and, and talking at the same time. And one key with this is um, whatever request you bring to God, bring it with thanksgiving. Right. Now I've found that is the, the, the thing that gives us the victory. Mm -hmm. So we look at our worries and we say, okay, how am I going to uh, pay for my bills? How am I going to do it? And I'm worried. And okay, God has already given me a verse about don't worry about tomorrow. So what do I do now? I say, thank you, Father. You are going to take care of me tomorrow. Amen. You're going to make sure I can pay that bill or that I will have work or that I will be able to sort out the problem in my family because you are with me. Yeah. And then the peace that is beyond understanding, really, it doesn't make any sense in my mind, but that peace that is mentioned here that is beyond our understanding, guard your heart. Yeah. 
it guards your heart and your mind. You can actually work. You can actually do your things as normal and actually be happy. And that is a miracle. And on top of that, that verse, and my God will meet all your needs according to his riches. And that's again a word of thanksgiving. And uh, the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. So he keeps your mind and um, heart at peace. And you will see those doors opening. The things changing as you have asked for. As you worship him. Because the, in the end, it's, it's we worship him, we love him, we, we yeah, give him the adoration for and, and thanksgiving for who he is and what he has done for us and what he will do for us. So that is my personal experience. Awesome. Thank you yes. so much. In fact, you've gone on to our next verse. <laughs> Don't worry, we've still got more to come. Thank you so much for sharing that because I think this is it's working. No. Hello, technical. There we go. Thank you so much. I put this down now. <laughs> so we're going to pray about that peace, which has come up so many times. But it is about having peace, isn't it? So we're going to look, talk to a wonderful Sarah, Vic Sarah. Um, I've got to say why I've also chosen Sarah. A couple of years ago now way before COVID, um, I talked to Sarah about prayer. And she so inspired me that it actually made a difference to how I have my prayer life. So I really wanted to hear from her today. So the next verse, can you have the next slide, uh, Nigel, please? Yeah, so that is what Marie had mentioned. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So, Sarah, how long have you been a Christian? I think, yeah. I think 17 years. I'm the baby one out of all this. <laughs> <laughs> and what does the scripture mean to us as Christians, do you think? Um, the thing, I mean, that's my profession, and I realize um, worries and fear is what I deal with every day. And I realize the more you worry, you're not going to have a solution for it. I realize only prayer is the key. And that's the problem why we have, it's given to us so that we can pray instead of worry because it does more harm to our bodies than good. Amen. And has the scripture helped you in a time of needing peace? Um, I've grown up with the siblings of eight. I lost my dad at one. My brother sitting at the back there. And we, I lived in fear, worry, and anxiety all my life. And I didn't come to know Jesus until, as you say, 17 years ago. So my life has been worry, fears, and anxiety. So in my growth into Christianity, I learned more about prayer, and that helped me to conquer my fears and anxiety. I haven't reached yet, but I have somewhere to lean on to help me to be strong in the Lord and trust God in time of need when I need it. Fantastic. Can you tell me a little bit about your prayer life? Share with us what... Um, I come in background of um, Muslim, and because of that, we have a mix of Muslim and Christianity in my family. So one sister of my ours decided to desert from us for 20 years. So I have to pray for peace, for unity, and to have my sister come back into the family. And with God answering my prayer, she came back last year, Christmas, wow. and she joined us over Christmas. We celebrate with her, and even on top of that, she's here as I speak today. She came two weeks ago oh, to visit wow. us. Praise the Lord. So, <laughs> Praise God. Amen. And because of that, I know what prayer is like. In my jacket at workplace, it's got this vest on. So when I work on the word, that's what I display oh, because wow. it's giving me results. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. She's such an inspiration to us. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, ladies, thank you so much. Let's give them all a round of applause. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Can stay, stay here. Stay, stay, because we're going to pray after it. Yes, yeah, stay. Stay on there. So I hope we're inspired by that. Yeah? I mean, I could talk all day about prayer, but it's good to hear from people who've got long in the tooth in God, and yet 
We all have struggles around prayer. It's not a unique thing to time in the Lord. And also what I did a couple of weeks ago, I asked some precious women in my world to give me some feedback around how they pray and some of their challenges around prayer. I want to share some of the feedback I got and some of the things I would answer to those things. But what I want to say, first of all, one of the responses I got back, which was really encouraging, was um, I pray frequently and I have no problems with praying. I thought, well, that's good. (laughs) You know, people were saying that they, they prayed even if God didn't answer their prayers because they know that God knows best. And they know that God's timing is the right timing and that the word of God says we should wait on him and that his will will be done. So to that, I'll answer, it's a habit. You've got to just develop the habit of praying. No one can show you how. You can't watch me and pray. It's not by osmosis. You've just got to make it a habit. Another thing we talked about was praying in public. And so the responses were, um, when they think about praying in public, how some of them struggle. Um, They're afraid of saying the wrong things. They lack confidence. They feel intimidated by those who have long prayers. And somebody said they feel that they sound uneducated or childlike. Some of us don't think we know enough scripture to pray. And someone said that they want to sound stupid or that their prayers are too short. Now, with all those things that people have said, the answer really is about selflessness. When we're afraid to pray in public, it's because we're looking at ourselves and judging and comparing ourselves to others. When what you really just need to do is just to see yourself as a child talking to a father. So why do I like praying now? Well, I've been born again, I think, 33 years now. And when I first got born again at the age of 21, I didn't know anything about prayer. And we used to hire Emmanuel and St. Andrew's Church just by the Sainsbury's over there. And on Thursday night was prayer meeting, which I dreaded going to. <laughs> and we'd sit around in a circle, there's about 10 of us, sit around in a circle, and our pastor would choose a psalm, and each of us had to do an uh, explanation of what we thought that psalm meant. And that's how I got the confidence of speaking in public about the Word of God. Because you didn't have to have a Bible knowledge, just speak what was in your heart. But after that hour, we'd go upstairs, to the upper room, so to speak, And on the edge of the room were chairs, and we actually kneeled down in front of the chair for an hour and pray. Now, to be honest, a lot of the time I was like, I don't know what to say, God. (laughs) So I've been kneeling there for an hour, not doing anything at all. But the habit of going week after week, after slowly, slowly, I began to say, okay, actually, this did happen to me this week, God, and can you help me? I've got to say, I'm going to be honest here. God has answered every single one of my prayers to date, except for the one, which is the husband of the course. <laughs> because I just trust in his timing. He doesn't answer it when I want it to be answered, but I know he does answer prayers. And that brings me to the next one, which is about unanswered prayers. When God doesn't answer, someone said, it's hard to have faith for the next prayer, especially when you pray around long-term illness. So why do I say he's answered every prayer? When I was 21, my mum was dying of cancer. I wasn't a Christian when she was dying. But I do remember going to a church near to my workplace. And I said, well, God, if you save my mum, I'll become a Christian. And the last time we went for a, a checkup for her, they said there was nothing they could do. And I went to the church chapel and I said, you let me down. I'm not going to become a Christian now. <laughs> But now that I'm looking back over life, that prayer was answered because she's in heaven, she's totally healed, no pain. And so I think we've got to come to this tension as Christians that even though we don't see the answer, God has given an answer. It might not be in the way that you want it, but it's in the way that's best for us. Somebody said that they get frustrated and waiting for God. I like this one. Someone said, I have a backup prayer, <laughs> just in case. I said something wrong. And sometimes we have unconfessed sin that we feel stops us from having our prayers answered. Somebody once said that the answers could be yes, no, or wait. And that's what we've got to trust God for. Sometimes he'll give you the go-ahead. Sometimes he'll stop you. 
And sometimes you'll just say, wait for the right thing. But in the book of John, 1 John verse 5, chapter 5, verse 14 to 15, it says that we are confident that when we pray God's will, he hears us. And because he hears us, we will receive what we've prayed for. So the question is then, how do we pray God's will? Well, his will is in the Bible. His word is his will. So if we pray scripturally, we know with confidence that God hears us, and in hearing us, he'll give us what we've prayed for. So how do we pray scripturally? Well, looking at the point that, uh, that Marie was making, when I personally have financial situations, I stand on Philippians 4.19, and I say, Jesus, because you're not poor, I'm not going to be poor. Because you have glorious riches, I need them in my bank account. <laughs> You know, I, I go with reverence, obviously. I'm not forcing him. He's not a slot machine. But I can quote that word back to him because it's a promise. And uh, he always fulfills. Another problem people have with praying is distractions. Um, somebody said they, they want to find a quiet time to hear from him. Some of us have wandering thoughts. Our phones, texts. Someone said needing to go to the loo. All of a sudden you're going to pray then you want to go to the loo. And someone said, drowning out the noise to focus on the Lord. Now, if we're going to have distractions around our prayer life, I would encourage to make it short. Okay, it doesn't have to be forever. It doesn't have to be long. Keep it a short prayer so you can keep focused in that time that you are praying. And when it comes to the phone, I too have a challenge with that. So this morning I had to do my devotion on my phone but I got distracted about why green peppers are never sold together with red peppers. <laughs> and it was a very interesting article, but nothing to do with my prayer life. So I, too, have that challenge. And sometimes I want to play music, worship music on my phone, so I have a reason to have the phone when I'm praying. But I'll encourage us to give God our attention. Give him time, because he deserves it. And that's the only way we can know our lives are going to get the blessing that he wants for us. Some people have mentioned about having difficulty hearing from God. I think uh, uh, Nikki made it very clear to us about having a special place to go to or having that written down journal where you write down what you feel God is saying to you. And it is about the whisper. I think God, like we um, talked last week, sometimes God is talking to you all the time, but you're so busy you can't hear him. So we need to give him time. Some people have uh, the feeling that they just don't feel like praying, and that's because of pressures, problems, sin, forgetfulness. Are you like me? At night time, you're so tired. It's like, add Jesus minus Satan, good night, God. <laughs> and then someone said, something bad happens that challenges your faith, but they know that God never leaves them nor forsakes them. And when it is a sin issue, when sin is stopping you from praying to God, remember that David repented of his sins so quickly because he wanted that relationship to be open with God all the time. Don't run from God when you feel sinful. Run to him. And I think I'll come to the last one. Yeah, this was a very interesting one. Somebody said, I'm too familiar to, with God. I talk to him like he's my dad. I worry I don't come reverently enough unless I'm saying sorry. That's great. Of course we come to God like a child. He wants us to do that. But somebody said that they feel that they're being selfish with their prayers because they only pray about themselves and their families. And they also said that world or political issues are so big, how can my little prayer help? I think the fact that we think like that means we're actually in a good place because then God can expand our ability to pray. And our final one, praying in faith. Somebody said they struggle sometimes to let go of the issue once they've prayed about it. Is that the same with you? We pray and then we go back for that prayer. And they don't think that God answers their prayers. And to that I'm going to say two things. You need to ask yourself, do I trust the God I'm praying to? And secondly, do I know the God 
I'm praying to. And we get to know him through his word. So I'm going to make a shameless plug right now. In our church, we have church prayer meetings. So on Thursday, from 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock, we have a prayer meeting for the whole church. You're very much invited. The link is on the website. Now, for those of us who are more um, stronger, on Sunday morning, 7.30 to 8.30, we also have a prayer meeting. And if you're free, please join us. So we all know there's power in prayer. And so there was a ship that was sinking, and the captain called out, does anyone know how to pray? And a priest stepped forward and said, yes, I know how to pray. And the captain said, good. Everyone else take a life jacket because we're short of one. (laughs) Praise the Lord. So, as I said, the simplest priest I could do is just pray. So we're going to pray for a couple of minutes together. I want you to just still your hearts before God and ask him to help you to want to pray and then believe that he's going to hear you. So let's close our eyes and be still for a couple of moments. That you're close here with us now and you're close to us when we depart this place. Thank you that we don't need to shout for you to hear us. That we don't even need to whisper or have words, but that sometimes the cry of our heart is enough. Thank you that we can come to you like little children to their father. That we can ask with simple words. That we don't need to make things complicated or a performance. Amen. Amen.